Right, let's get started. The top of the aisle. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining our Go Global webinar series. Today's webinar, How to Sell Online in Canada. Um, we're delighted to have you join us. Um, we look forward to uh, presenting today's website localization and online marketing for the Canadian marketing. Um, and wherever you may be today, we see from the list of attendees, you're from the United States. So welcome to you and a very good morning to you in the US and a very good afternoon to you, those registered and joining us today in Europe. Um, I do at this time also want to acknowledge the very many of you who record these webinars and listen to them on demand. Um, so that is whenever you want, at whatever time you want. So whether you're joining us live or you're listening to this recorded, um, you are very welcome. My name is John Worthington. I am CEO here at IVT Online, and I have the huge pleasure of introducing today's webinar, How to Sell Online in Canada. I'm doing so from our offices in London today, and I am joined by a number of key speakers that I will present to you shortly. I do love our Go Global webinar series. Um, there's so much information out there. There's so much to learn and keep abreast with in the world of international trade, in the world of growing your exports, growing your sales, your brands and your businesses globally. Um, so very exciting topics in our Go Global webinar series and none more so than today's subject, which is Canada. Uh, selling online in Canada. Now, just to give you a quick picture, um, get, let's get some macro numbers out there, um, just in case you are not aware of the size of the US goods and services relationship with Canada, which totaled 628 billion in 2016. Think of that, 628 billion in transactions. Um, exports were 320 billion. Imports, 310 billion. So the US has a goods and services trade surplus with Canada of 12 billion. Canada is a great trading partner for American companies. A quick dive into Europe, um, and it's similar to the extent, but on a different scale. Um, Canada's second most important trading partner after the US, accounting for 10% of Canada's total international trade. Canada exports to the 28 European markets were 33 billion and the value of merchandise from the European Union was 53 billion. So another trade surplus there. Um, NAFTA agreement and CETA agreements clearly very, very important. So in that context, we look forward to presenting how to sell online in Canada. Um, before we really jump into it, just a little housekeeping. Um, in housekeeping, um, I will apologize already for returnees, and I know there are many of you who come back again and again for our online global webinar series, and we thank you for joining us again. Um, just a quick note on this webinar is one in a series. It's all about growing your sales, your brands and businesses globally. Um, we've been doing this for well over three years now, so there is a rich catalogue of recorded webinars. They're all available on demand. Um, if you go to www.ivt.onl backslash resources webinars, you'll find them all. And you can go and search on the subjects and just watch them and listen to them whenever you want. Going forward, we have webinars planned for the next three to four months, so don't hesitate to look at those as well and join us in the future. Today's webinar will be 45 minutes long. This introduction by myself, then I will be handing over to Susanna as our keynote speaker um, presenting the program. Um, there will be four polls, so please be ready, participate, share your views. Your opinions are very welcome. We will be um, holding questions at the end. You can see on your screen there, bottom right hand side, it says questions. Please click that box submit your questions and we will be answering them. There is a chat box, so please use it. Do know that at the end of this webinar, which will be recorded, um, there will also be a brief survey. So in that survey, we would welcome uh, some feedback. It helps us to do a better job going forward. And as I said, this was recorded and on Friday, you will receive a copy of this in your email with a link. So um, email boxes, watch your email boxes on Friday, for the recorded version. So now sit back, 
Um, if it's the morning, enjoy coffee. If it's in the afternoon, well, whatever you might enjoy in the afternoon. Um, and we will dive into the webinar. Let's get back onto the main theme. Today's theme is all about selling online in Canada. And I'm proud to be joined by Susanna Hardy and Nancy Ward. Susanna Hardy, Director for Client Services at IBT Online. Nancy Ward, Director of Grow Trade Consulting. And over the past week, there's been a lot of hard work in preparing this webinar. Susanna and Nancy have been researching and assembling and curating all of that useful practical information on how to sell online in Canada. And in today's online world, that's all about websites, that's website localization, and of course, online marketing in the Canadian market. And the results of their endeavors is going to be presented to you in today's webinar. But also do know that there is an ebook available, Exporter's Guide to Canada, again, in the ibt.onl backslash resources page. Um, IBT Online and Grow Trade Consulting work every day for our clients' requirements in Canada, helping clients to be successful in that market with valuable up-to-date practical experience. We have first-hand case studies that we're gonna be sharing with you and unique insights into what works and also uh, what does not work so that our clients are successful in Canada. A word on Susanna on the left of your screen. Susanna, a director for client services at IBT Online. Susanna heads up our operational focus for companies, helping them be successful in multiple markets. Um, if Susanna, when she's presenting, sounds a bit Canadian or American, um, well, in many ways she is. Susanna is very international. Can I, uh, Susanna was born in Germany, uh, but was educated in Europe, uh, but as well in the US and in Canada, attending University of McMaster and Toronto. Uh, Susanna has experience in international online business and online marketing and works with the IBT online team, uh, researching, developing and uh, successful programs for companies that want to grow internationally. Nancy Ward, on the right of your screen, a director of Grow Trade Consulting. Nancy may be known to many of you um, as she has assisted many, many hundreds of US companies and SMEs to help find Canadian partners and business opportunities in a wide ranging uh, number of sectors. And in 2004, she formed Grow Trade Consulting, which is based in Toronto with a dedicated team. Um, prior to this, Nancy had a successful career with Canadian Trade and Office of the Conference of Great Lakes and St. Lawrence Governors and Premiers before working in sales and marketing with the Canadian subsidiary of the U.S. automotive parts manufacturer. And Nancy is also an active member and former president of the International Trade Club of Toronto and the vice president of communications in the Organization of Women in International Trade. You can see that Nancy is very, very well connected and a very uh, important resource in helping to grow trade in Canada. Grow Trade is dedicated to helping companies grow their business in Canada. So they have a team of specialists, so don't hesitate to get in touch, whatever your sector is, sector specialists, and they have a range of services that include partner searches and appointments, market entry strategy analysis, uh, product market viability studies and trade mission development. So um, there you go. If you want to know more, um, you've got a URL there, www.growtrade.ca. You've also got an email and phone. So get in touch with Nancy and um, I'm sure you'll find a lot of success there in growing in Canada. Now, two words on IBT Online. IBT Online is a private company. IBT has helped over 400 companies, um, provided services in website localization and online marketing programs. Um, IBT Online, a US company and a European company. Uh, the US entity has programs with over 14 US states, um, has won the Trade Champion Award in 2016, and a British American Business's Best Innovative Company Award. So a catalog of success there for IBT Online in helping companies grow their businesses, grow their brands and sales internationally. So with that, um, I will be handing over to um, Susanna for the um, program. 
and looking forward to listening and learning as we go forward for today's program on growing business online in Canada. Susanna. Thank you very much, John, and it's a real pleasure to be here with everybody and, and share the, the podium with Nancy, who's really the, the renowned expert on business in Canada. So I'm going to pass the, the mic over to Nancy right away, who's going to give us a sort of an overview of Canada business and um, what we can expect in Canada. And, uh, and then I'll be taking up a bit later when we talk about the online side. So Nancy, over to you. Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for the opportunity to talk a little bit about Canada today and some of the trade opportunities that exist for US and European companies. So I guess the first thing I wanted to do um, was to give a little bit of a, a snapshot of the Canadian market for everybody. Um, certainly most companies are familiar with Canada, but may not be as familiar with the, the actual geographic size of the country. So we are the second largest country in the world, and this is relevant because of the uh, the logistics and distribution challenges uh, that may uh, that may be um, in concert with the size. Now, population, we are just over 36 and a half million people as of this year. And we are one of the, we certainly have a very small population relative to our geographic size, but similar in terms of economic um, access and ability to the US market. Our GDP, as it notes here, is uh, one and a half trillion dollars. And our GDP growth is, is interesting in the sense that we were at 1.5% last year, but this year we're looking at uh, 2.5 and closer to 3% growth. So we're actually one of the fastest growing of the OECD countries at this point. Unemployment, as you can see, at 6.3, which has been, which is relatively low here. And of course, we are a bilingual country at a federal level, so uh, which is interesting for companies selling retail products here, especially food products, as all packaging must be in both English and in French. Now, as I mentioned, the, the state of the U.S. Economy is very strong, or, or the state of the Canadian economy, I should say, is quite strong right now, um, and looking to potentially outpace the U.S. Uh, and leading the G7, as I mentioned. The Canadian dollar, which is something obviously for U.S. and European countries to, or companies to be concerned or just take into consideration, has fluctuated somewhat um, this year, uh, a little bit stronger in the last month or so, but it has uh, been as low as um, as 1.24, as it notes here. And inflation has been consistently low in Canada. Uh, typically, the Bank of Canada likes to keep it within 2% range, and we've been in the 1.4% range as of August of, of this year. You know, a couple of other things to note in terms of, um, in terms of our key industries. Many, many people think of Canada as being really a resource-based economy. And while there's certainly some truth to that, I think many, many companies are surprised to learn that in fact, Canada has quite a diverse economy. Um, some of the key sectors you see here, overall, Canada really is actually a service economy with 80% of our, our GDP being generated by that and a huge percent of our workforce as well being part of the services economy and whether that's financial services, medical services, retail services here uh, and ICT or technology which is um, which is noted in in the slide in many different aspects of the technology sector ICT. Um, one that's not noted here actually is gaming which is a, a very large segment in the Canadian market or in the Canadian ICT sector and growing rapidly. And also relevant to the ICT sector is the growth of cryptocurrencies in Canada, which uh, is relevant uh, more so for the online side of things, but we're certainly seeing more interest in uh, alternate ways of paying for things. And I think um, as, as you'll note further on in the, in the, presentation that Canada has a, a fairly um, open uh, arena for this type of activity. Now manufacturing, obviously Canada is a very strong manufacturing base. Automotive, we are um, partly because of NAFTA, we are one of the largest exporters of automobile equipment and goods, uh, but also aerospace. Uh, we're a very strong aerospace producer, both with homegrown domestic companies as well as large international companies that have bases here. 
agriculture. We're certainly a very strong supplier of agricultural products, whether it's grains or beef, um, but also in the um, greenhouse segment as, a, as a, um, an example. We have one of the largest greenhouse segments within North America in the southwestern Ontario area. And of course, energy. Uh, Canada is very well known for the oil sands out in Alberta, um, having or maintaining, I guess, about a, approximately a third or the third largest oil reserve in the world. Uh, but lesser known, the fact that Canada is also a leader in hydroelectric power, I think um, number three in the world. And you can see energy does make up close to 3% of the, the country's GDP. Now, when we look um, more specifically at trade, Canada has, because of its small population, has had to be a trading nation um, for most of its, its uh, time in existence. So we see, and um, John and uh, John had mentioned the propensity of the Canada-US trade relationship. And certainly, um, just to dig deeper for the United States, approximately 37 U.S. states now count Canada as their number one trade partner. So certainly um, NAFTA has been a great boon to, to growing those trade relationships. Uh, and, and certainly um, I'm sure many, many companies are interested in what's going on in the negotiation. And I can certainly speak to that a little bit later if folks have questions. And also now, as of September 21st, Canada has the CETA agreement with, um, with Europe. So we're looking to, to see how that will grow uh, and expand the, the already strong relationship with all of the EU trading members. And Canada does have a number of other foreign investment and promotion and protection trade agreements, uh, as you can see here. And of course, is a member of the WTO and, uh, and works strongly or works closely with, uh, within that organization to promote free and open trade. So moving on to... Is that time, Nancy? Can I jump in and do our first sure. poll? Okay, well, oh, quick. absolutely. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I'm, uh, by the way, um, it is clear what an open market Canada is, and and um, how good uh, it seems to, uh, for the trade agreements that are, uh, are displayed there, and all of the ongoing negotiations. Canada clearly is a is a country which exporters need to look at, and. Um, those ones that have already been successful, which is where I'm going to launch this first poll, which is, please, all about you. Do you, does your company already do business in Canada? And I guess, of course, we're going to be asking why, you know, if not, why? But um, the questions are, yes, I do via local distributors or in-market partners. I'm doing so online. It's a combination of two or perhaps not. And you might be thinking about it. Let me give you some feedback. A full 44% are not doing so. They say they're thinking about it. 20% are saying no. Well, that's interesting. So um, it's really 18% are saying yes, they do via distributors. And some 10% are saying yes, they do so online. Look, thank you for those numbers. Um, clearly, as an audience, we're addressing people, um, audiences that are thinking about it, um, that currently are not doing so. So with that information, I hope that we'll do a better job in our, our communication and make sure we pitch it accordingly. I'm pressing my, that is the end of the first poll. And uh, Nancy, I'm gonna hand back to you and thank you. Thanks so much, John. Well, that's interesting to know what the audience is in terms of uh, in terms of the fact that many companies are actually not doing a business in Canada. So I'm I'm curious to to learn more. Well, I guess again, probably participating is um, is hopefully learning um, for your for your own business is what opportunities might exist here. So I want to delve in a little bit more about doing business in Canada, and I think um, we're we were talking about different industry sectors. And now I want to talk a little bit about our distinct regional markets. So as I mentioned in, the, in my introduction, Canada is the second largest country in the world. And what we do find is that because of that massive size and the fact that we really only actually have one highway connecting from east to west, uh, we really see, what we really see in Canada is um, probably five distinct markets. And if we go from west to east, you're going to see that each of those has specific industry segments within them. If we look at Western Canada, of course, British Columbia, um, Alberta and Saskatchewan, 
these these provinces are known for oil and gas obviously in the case of of alberta uh, food processing in the case of alberta again with cattle um, and then if we look at british columbia uh, strong forestry sectors strong fishery sectors but also very strong ict and medical space uh, and then when we look at saskatchewan again very strong farming but also um, also some mining and oil and gas activities as well if we go a little bit further to manitoba which is really kind of central or on the cusp of Western Canada, we have a very diverse economy, including everything from transportation, aerospace, mining, um, and ICT as well. Now, if we look, if we move over on the east side of, of Canada to the maritime provinces, we have very strong or very small population bases here, but some interesting segments in terms of aquaculture, strong fisheries, um, strong functional food segments, as well as offshore oil and gas, wind technology, um, and biotechnology. Now, if we look at Ontario, and Ontario and Quebec really are the heartland of Canada. Ontario makes up about 40% of the GDP generation um, for, the, for the country, and as well has close to 40% of the population. And we have very diverse economies here in terms of manufacturing, the automotive, the aerospace, ITC, biotechnology, life sciences, but also, as I mentioned earlier, strong agricultural segments, um, forestry, uh, and it obviously very strong financial services and overall services economy. Now, Quebec, again, very, um, very interesting economy in the sense it's quite diverse. We have a lot of, of more traditional industries in terms of mining, pulp and paper, uh, forestry, uh, but also very strong segments in terms of life science, uh, ICT, and aerospace, uh, as well as being a leader in renewable energy and the hydro space. So as I say, when, and with these distinct regional markets, you also realize that oftentimes is actually more north-south than it is east-west because of these logistical um, challenges that I mentioned, having one highway, one major rail line, that kind of thing. So, so oftentimes we find that um, US companies may find more success selling to Western Canada as an example if they use their distribution network out of California. Um, so as I say, it's uh, certainly the, the size of the market does provide some, uh, some interesting considerations when you think about the movement of your goods. And I know, um, I know Susanna may touch on that later in one of her case studies, so keep note of that. So I want to talk a little bit more about doing business specifically in Quebec. Quebec, um, Quebec, in some ways, we kind of joke is a little bit like a different country, and, and certainly in terms of um, in terms of the political side of things, there have been, you know, there have certainly been challenges uh, with Quebec within the Canadian uh, Canadian. Uh, relationship i suppose you know sovereignty association and and certainly quebec looking at ways to assert their language and nationality within the canadian framework but quebec as a as a business location is is really an interesting one in the sense that quebecers love innovation they really enjoy working with american and european firms that have innovation and have innovative products and services they are really open to uh, building business relationships and they are very relationship-based economy, I would say. Now, there are important considerations when doing business in Quebec. It's very important to have a Quebec and French speaking partner. Um, sometimes Canadian company or US companies, I will say, will, will say to me, well, I've got a partner in Ontario that's serving Quebec. And I always ask them, well, does that partner speak French? Um, you know, how much time do they spend in the province? So it's very important, as I say, to, to have a local partner when doing business with, with Quebec companies. And the other thing to keep in mind, too, is that when signing things like distribution agreements in Quebec, the, level, uh, the legal platform that's used is the civil law platform, which is um, similar to the state of Louisiana, as an example. So always keep that in mind, as I say, when, when uh, forging relationships or signing agreements in Quebec, that it's a different platform than what you see in the, the rest of Canada. And the other thing too, if you're selling products into the retail market, uh, keep in mind that French labeling compliance, while well, um, certainly if you're selling retail products in all of Canada, there are specific bilingual um, issues to or um, 
regulations to comply with, but you'll find that those are actually more stringent in Quebec with respect to French labeling. Okay, so moving on to the Canadian e-commerce landscape, which is really what folks are here today to learn about. And I think the thing to keep in mind with Canada is that we really are a, a first to first to uh, market in terms of e-commerce. You've got to understand because of Canada's small banking system, we essentially have six large banks in Canada. And we have a fairly conservative banking industry. However, because of that, um, that relative our centralization, it's been much easier to introduce things like online banking. So we were certainly, or Canadians were at the forefront of that within North America. Uh, and because of that, that is an, it has been an easy transition to online shopping. So as you can see from this slide, 80% of, almost 80% of Canadians shopped online last year. And the overall e-commerce market, $29.6 billion. So that's certainly one to, one to look at. And I think what Susanna is gonna talk about a lot um, on the second part of this presentation is the necessity of being online in Canada and having not only online presence, but also having a social media presence, especially for retail, commercial or retail products, um, but more and more so for business to business products. And, uh, and as I said, Susanna is gonna walk you through some terrific strategies for that. A couple of last areas I wanted to touch on about success and also other considerations in Canada when doing business here. Now, Canada is, uh, while a NAFTA partner, is still another market. So for Canadian or for US companies doing business in Canada, you do need to realize that we have in many cases, some slightly harmonized systems, but also some very different regulatory systems in place. A very good example is it, of this is the Safe Food for Canadians Act, which is rolling out finally in, uh, in 2018, second quarter. And this is looking at a, a huge modernization of, Canadian, of the Canadian um, food and safety um, regulatory regime as it, as it includes food. So all food products now um, in different categories are going to have to go uh, undergo different licensing requirements. And so for U.S. companies in the food sector that are selling it to Canada, th this may change how they do business. So again, this is an example of just one example of some different regulatory aspects that always need to be considered. Increased compliance for border crossing. Um, unfortunately, after 9-11, there was a, a very strong push, and well, I shouldn't say unfortunately, but certainly a, a, a much bigger focus on security at the border. And there's been ongoing, ongoing work, um, you know, under the Regulatory Cooperation Council to look at smoothing the way for um, border crossing on both sides so that security is increased, but that known companies are able to get their products across the border in a much more efficacious way. Complying with all provincial and territorial regulations, and this refers also to online, uh, online sales or can do, but interestingly, it's easier to sell between the United States and Canada than it is to sell between provinces and territories in the Canadian market. Uh, and that's certainly an area where Canada has, has done or needs to do much more work, uh, but again, it's another area to, to, to consider. Terms and conditions for online sales, this also can relate back to the provincial and territorial regulations. And of course, currency fluctuations, as I mentioned earlier, you know, Canada, the Canadian currency is, has typically been worth um, less than the US currency. So this is a consideration for, for any US company selling products into the Canadian market. How can they work with their Canadian customers to provide other incentives to purchase, um, you know, does it always matter? Not always in terms of having a higher price. If, if the product you're selling is a, a, has a very strong value proposition, is able to save time, money, um, and reduce labor in, in different applications. So these are things that, um, that US companies and European companies can work with our Canadian customers to, to relate their value proposition. CETA, which we discussed before, um, certainly will open up, I think, a lot of opportunity for um, for U.S. or for, I should say, for European Canadian trade growth, but also may um, enable U.S. companies to partner with Canadian firms to access 
uh, more European opportunities. NAFTA negotiations uh, are ongoing. Um, we're in the fourth round now of discussions back in Washington. And certainly there has been some progress made in certain areas. Um, digital trade is one that's, um, that certainly was an area that I think all three uh, NAFTA companies agreed that needed to have an update. Um, so there's been some good progress there. There's been good progress on uh, border compliance and, and a few other different areas, good trade, good trade practices, um, telecom, for instance. I believe this week, um, or the, the round four of talks is going to focus a lot on agriculture, which of course is always a bit of a sticky area. Um, so we'll, we'll look forward to, to seeing some good progress there. And trade disputes, certainly um, these are ongoing challenges, which we, you know, we certainly, softwood lumber is one uh, that has been an ongoing issue since the 1980s between the United States and Canada. Uh, and certain areas too, like um, content, local content for products. I know this is a big key area for, for the United States and NAFTA negotiation, specifically as it relates to the automotive industry. I think typically, or now within the current NAFTA, 62% um, of product within a vehicle needs to be of, of NAFTA content. I think um, the United States is looking to up that a bit more, maybe into the 70% range. Uh, and I believe, um, I mean, the other thing that's so interesting with, with NAFTA and the automotive industry, um, the typical product moves across, or typical component or part of a vehicle will move across the Canadian and US border an average of seven times before it is uh, put into a final vehicle. So this again really sort of shows the importance of the relationship between Canada, the United States, and Mexico um, within the both the automotive and the aerospace industries. So I think I'm wrapping up my segment here uh, and uh, I wanted to finish with a few strategies for success. So, so what you see here is, is really how we help companies in fit their, their strategy for the Canadian market. Really understanding that Canada is a mature market and having, having to look at where your products and services fit a niche or, or a gap in a, in a customer's offerings or current offering. Really being able to differentiate your product and service from the competition and really understanding the competition in Canada. How are they marketing? How are they positioning themselves? And how can you, um, you know, take a different strategy and differentiate yourself. As I mentioned before, or as I mentioned multiple times before, understanding Canada's vast geography and where, you know, where your product and service might fit. Is it Ontario? Is it in Northern Canada, in the mining industry, for instance? Um, and really looking at not only different geographies, but also different industry segments where your product may fit. Most companies typically start start their export platform into Ontario or Quebec because they are the largest population markets in Canada. But as I said, there are certainly opportunities in Western Canada and Eastern Canada and the Northern markets as well. And really understanding that Canada, Canadians and the, your Canadian customers need servicing. It's not, it's not sufficient to send product up, you know, do a training session and never go back because you know what, your Canadian or your uh, your other competitors that are successful, they are out doing the trade shows, they're doing training, they're going out with, um, with their Canadian customers and troubleshooting their customers. And lastly, social media. As I mentioned before, it is really growing in importance uh, and certainly we're, we're seeing it grow in importance in different industry sectors at different rates. Um, but it, it is not an option not to have a social media strategy moving forward. And really understanding too, lastly, what are the relationships that work best for you? Is it the traditional distributor model? Is it a joint venture partner? Is it direct sales, online sales? Is it a marketing um, or manufacturer's rep that can work with a distributor or work with you in a 3PL scenario and go out and visit and merchandise your products um, to potential customers? So all of these things, as I say, are what are what GrowTrade helps companies to um, to understand as they look to Canada and, and understand that it is a it is a different market in the United States. We have many similarities. Proximity makes it a great first export market, but it is again an international market that uh, requires a slightly different tact. So 
thank you so much for your your time and i think john's going to jump in with poll number two I certainly am, uh, Nancy, um, and we'll be coming back um, uh, with more information and questions. So, Nancy, thank you so much. Lots and oh. lots of really, I mean, the information, and I love your strategies. Um, thank you. Uh, You're welcome. Thank uh, you, everyone, for your attention. You know, the, the companies that were flagging up that they were thinking about it, the companies that were not doing so, um, please, there you have uh, something of some, some checklist there, which gives us the opportunity to dive into our second poll. Um, so here you go. I'm launching it now. Please be ready. Participate. What are your main export challenges for Canada? There you go. Nancy was talking about a lot of those subjects, so absolutely appropriate. Um, is it finding the right local partner? That can be a challenge. What about logistics and supply chains? Is it currency, tax and regulations? Um, is it online? Is it engaging uh, with websites? Is it none of these? Um, so let me give you feedback. 42% are saying it is the top one. It's all about the right local partner. Um, secondly, um, it is 38% are saying it's all about currency, tax and regulation. Um, logistics is a strong third contender there. Um, so very interesting feedback. Some are, are actually 18% are saying none of these. Well, we'll be interested to know what, which ones are your challenges going forward. So I thank you very much. I'm shutting down this second poll. Here we go. Yes, that is the end of that. The poll is now officially closed and I'm going to be handing over to Susanna for Canada Online. Thank you very much, John, and uh, thank you also, Nancy. A fantastic presentation, I must say. Um, I'm going to dive straight into sort of the online side, looking first at sort of a snapshot of, 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 of Canada Online. 90% you know, of Canadians are online. So, uh, you know, that... that uh, that's clear. It's, it's actually a slightly higher percentage than the USA. Um, and 64% have social media network. Now, that's slightly behind the USA, but it is still right up there. What's interesting as well is that that 64% is growing quite consistently in double digit numbers. But what you see when you have, when you look at Canada Online and compare it to the United States, is that it is quite similar. Um, uh, give you one example. Uh, or, or it looks quite similar at the first glance anyway. If I give you one example. The main search engine used in the United States is Google, which has about 65% market share. In Canada, it's got about a 64%. So it's very, very similar. The next being uh, big in Yahoo, uh, with each about sort of 20 and 15%. So for certainly for US, companies looking at their Canada online profile, they should see something which resembles home. That should be a reassuring thing. This is, this is quite, you know, this is an easy step that should not be difficult to do as an online, as an online extension, as an online build. Equally for European companies looking at, at, your, at uh, Canada, they will find a similar sort of strength in terms of the social media. You know, 71% of Canadians are on Facebook. That's very similar to what you see in uh, in, in Europe. Um, and again, the use of, of uh, Canadian businesses, you know, sort of nearly 40% of Canadian businesses using social media uh, actively, that is actively within you know, at least one posting a month actively. Uh, that's again, very similar to what you find in core Europe. So again, for both the United States and uh, European businesses, they should be able to look at, at, at Canada and say, that is not too foreign for me. That is something I can do. And, um, and I think that's an encouraging thing. You should take advantage of it. Just wanted to go a little bit into the main trends, both for the sort of uh, shoppers and the B2B side. Um, and again, this is, it's a mature market. As Nancy was saying, this is a mature economy. And you'll find similar uh, statistics, similar trends across most of Europe and most of the United States. Um, Online shopping is something which is very developed, very highly developed, very established and uh, accepted. Um, it's seen as sort of safe, uh, uh, efficient and so on. Despite the fact that Canada is so large and does have such logistic issues, such logistic challenges, uh, online shopping is the, is, is the way, is the way uh, people like to go. I will get into some detail because there's some major caveats and differences, however. 
I wanted to focus in on the B2B side in particular. This is something which a lot of uh, small, medium-sized companies tend to sort of put off as they say, oh no, you know, it's, it's all by reputation or something. This is simply not true. B2B increasingly is looking at your online profile. One of the first things you will do when looking at a new purchase, a new, a new uh, potential, a potential um, supplier is search them out and check them out online. Uh, so, you know, there's some, there's some Forrester research that was done. Um, you know, three quarters of businesses look at other businesses before they buy something. Um, the other point is videos. And this is something we're seeing again and again across, across the world, actually. Uh, videos are really taking an important part of, of the, uh, the time on a website. And if you think about it, a, a video can explain something in one or two minutes. Um, something that is difficult to, you know, diff perhaps difficult or complex engineering and can explain it very quickly, very succinctly to your audience. Uh, and again, that's just part of any strategy that we would, we, would, um, we would be building for companies is, you know, look at your videos, make sure you've got great video side. And again, for Europeans and American, U.S. companies, the Canadian com uh, market does not pose particular barriers um, you know, they're, they're strong on YouTube, for example. Um, mobile, again, this is not a mobile first developing economy. This is a mature economy. Nonetheless, there's a very strong growth in mobile and mobile enabled. So again, any website has got to be mobile enabled uh, for the Canadian market. And then finally, this, this amazing statistic, which is quite out there really, quite different from many of the things that we're seeing in the United States and across Europe, nearly half of the B2B side are millennials. So it's really kind of the young pushing that forward and growing that forward very much uh, uh, in Canada. There is another great specific, you know, very, something very specific in Canada, which has got to do with uh, legislation and digital compliance. This is quite different from the United States, but Europeans will think, ah, I know this, this looks, this looks familiar. And this is something called CASEL, which is Canadian anti-spam legislation. It actually came in in, in in 2014, effective law by 1st of July 2017. It doesn't matter if you're a Canadian company or not a Canadian company. If you are interacting into Canada, if you're emailing something, a company in Canada or um, uh, potential clients in Canada, you need to be digitally compliant. Um, and the main, I mean, there's a, there's a little infogram there from the Canadian government, which I thought was kind of handy. There's lots of information on it. We have a blog on it as, as well on our website and then an ebook on it as well on our website. But the main core message is that you have to have a very clear, very obvious, very easy opt-in to any, um, to any email. Uh, so you can't just sort of, you know, send something to someone and then expect them not to uh, consider it spam. So that's something you need to really watch out with in Canada, much stricter than the United States. One other thing I'd say about this is watch that space. This is something that is evolving fast. We know that in Europe, there's the new legislation coming out in April 2018. In the United States and Canada, expected May 2018. So again, this is a fast changing area uh, and it is getting tough. There is real, uh, you know, heavy fines going on uh, in uh, if you're not compliant. Um, uh, we've seen this uh, for, for, for companies that we're now working with, uh, you know, who were fined uh, because they didn't have things in Germany. And we're seeing this also in Canada. So really be very careful, be aware of it. And certainly all the, the websites we're building are, you know, automatically have the, uh, the um, uh, digital compliance. I wanted then to talk specifically about what we mean about website localization for Canada. So how do you actually make your website really Canadian, maybe really fit into the Canadian scene uh, besides being digitally compliant? And one of the best examples I can do, in fact, is to say what not to do. And this is something that's very specific to Canada. There's a company called Target. I'm sure you all know it. Um, uh, they have a textbook case on how not to go internationally. Um, the poor things tried out from Canada, got it all wrong. And this is now, it's, it's, it's absolutely standard now for MBA 
uh, students in, in sales and marketing and international trade to look at the target Canada uh, case study. What happened was that they uh, decided to go into Canada already in 2011. They bought some stores. In 2013, they launched Target Canada. By 2015, they closed it. It was such a disaster. Everything got, went wrong. They underestimated launching um, uh, across such a huge space. They underestimated the logistics, um, all these sort of long list of things they did wrong. But the major thing they did wrong was not to adapt and take account of Canada. They assumed it would be just easy, just rolling out something that you already had. It actually proved to them that Canada is a separate market. You cannot just have a, a rollout as you would in, in terms of a new state. Um, the Canadian market is different. And what was amazing to us on the online side was that you know, one of the things they launched, they, they, they did not do in 2013, they did not launch an e-commerce site. Even though Canadians were taking up e-commerce uh, at, at, at very high, you know, e-commerce was growing over 20% in 2013. Target decided not to bother. Um, they then sold all their stores and, and, and wrote it all off, uh, costing them about five and a half billion dollars to write down their Canadian assets in 2015. And then launched an online site and again, this is case book, uh, uh, case study stuff in for MBAs. A lot of people have been studying this. Um, their Canadian online site was equally not localized. So, for example, for a Canadian going on to uh, the Target um, uh, website, they couldn't really get a Canadian website. There was the Target.com. So, you know, that you went on there. There's no geolocation. There's no global page. So a Canadian would be redirected to some international target site, which is an international e-commerce site, not really fit purpose for Canada. It didn't have even Canadian pricing on it. Uh, it didn't have Canadian options. Hi, when can I be delivered? I live in Saskatchewan. You couldn't ask that question. So it was really quite astonishing that having had failed on the localization of their physical stores, they failed also online. And uh, this is, as I said, it's been getting what it has Unfortunately for Target, great store, but really rested up in Canada because they did not localize effect effectively. Um, so that is a sort of a snapshot of what not to do. And now I want to talk about what you need to do and how to localize. Now, one of the easiest ways of looking at that is to go back to basics and say, what are search engines? And search engines, how do they work for Canada? I am sitting in the United States, my search engine, you know, three quarters, two thirds of the United States uses Google as their search engine. Google, I can just, Google.com, I can just use that for Canada. But Google localizes. Google says, no, no, it's a specific market. Google USA is not the same as Google Canada. Google makes sure it looks at it from the, from the searcher's point of view. So they are interested in people sitting in Canada looking for Canadian responses or the best possible response for them. If you're sitting elsewhere, not in Canada, you will not be given that priority. So just remember that, you know, if you want to be visible, localized, you need to make sure that the search engines find you, like you, that you tick the boxes for the search engine to be market specific and user focused. So Canada specific and focused towards your, uh, your searcher, your, your prospective uh, client. Overall, what's important for the search engines and these sort of what they call crawlers that go up and down your website looking for algorithmic uh, um, um, uh, categories that they can, they can discover and rank. Overall, what's really important is great content. Uh, obviously, you've got to have relevant keywords. Obviously, it's got to be very descriptive, but it's got to be really great content. It has to address what your, what your searcher is looking for. And then finally, also, as I said before, it has to be digitally compliant. Susanna, um, Susanna, yeah. thank you so much for this. It's been jumping in on, on search engines. Can we jump to poll number three? Yes, please. Oh, yes, please. Right. Okay, to follow up on that, thank you for all of that information. And please, related to that, I'm launching poll number three. Here goes. Are your export websites localized for their target audiences? Number one, yes. 
Number two, thinking about it. Number three, no. So if, have you got websites for each country? You know, is it localized, as Susanna was uh, explaining? Do you have a Canada.ca website? Do you have a website for the US? Do you have websites for the Mexican market, uh, the German market, etc.? So 21% are saying yes. 42% are saying thinking about it, and 37% are saying no. Well, look, I mean, very interesting. Thank you very much. I'm sure that there'll be some more information coming back on that. Therefore, that is poll number three, which I'm shutting down. Can we close on that? And I hand back to Susanna. Thank you very much. I'm conscious of time, and I do want to leave some time over for questions. Um, you do have this slide deck uh, will be sent to you if you've registered. So you, here is the list of the key, sort of our checklist, if you like, of what makes up a localized website. So these are sort of the key things that I would say. We've talked about regulatory. We've talked about um, optimizing it for search engines and things. But I, I guess the, the other key things to look at um, are sort of adapting sort of some of the design of the pictures and making sure that you're taking into account culture and also uh, that you have the right correct content management systems with the software that you put it on and that you host locally. This is important for uploading and downloading speeds. Anyway, go through those at your leisure or get back to us if you want to have more questions. I'm sort of going to go move on and just show you a couple of examples um, of localized websites. You can see in this case we've used flags for Canada. That's not always that obvious, in fact, because you're going to be working in two languages. Um, we would say, you know, for a Canadian website, if you're going to have a Canadian website, you might want to even split the flag between a Quebec flag and the rest of Canada flag, or at least always say, are you going to have a specific French one as well as a Canadian English one? So that's a, one of the first things you want to want to address when looking at um, at, a, at a Canadian website and uh, some of the ones we've seen. It. And I will just point out again, sort of you know, the cookie policy that you'll see when you're building Canadian websites um, and and some of the key sort of other sort of visuals that you have. I wanted to move on as well to why one builds websites. You know, why do we actually do this? Um, uh, we talked uh, a bit about sort of, you know, it, uh, reaching out and, 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 and connecting to your local prospective market in Canada. And I guess that really comes about using your website as a, as a platform, as a springboard for your social media. And this um, graph, uh, these, 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 these illustrations for me, best how how um, uh, companies have now changed in their relationship to customers, partners, competitors. You know, in the past, uh, it was a more simple relationship. Your customers didn't always be able to speak to each other. Today, they interact. They they give reviews on their on your product. Um, uh, they might say something on your Facebook. <laughs> you know, so there's a lot to be taken into account here, and you need to have a much more um, aware and involved, engaged view of your social media uh, presence and world. And that is probably the best way also to, to interact with your customers and use your local website as a platform for social media. And one of the great things about having a localized website is also that you can tweak it and decide on its priorities. And this, again, helps you also with your return on investment and deciding on and how, to, how to calculate your return on investment. Um, and again, I'm going through a bit fast here to give some question time. But I wanted to try and illustrate what I meant here by these little, you know, spaceships. <laughs> if you have um, a key website, a core website, you can use that website. Let's say you have a Canada website. You can use your social media to distinguish your different needs. And that may well be something like finding a new distributor in one province, or it may mean same thing, you know, um, in this one province, let's say in Quebec, I don't really have a good brand development. I'm not really known in Quebec. Therefore, I'm gonna focus my social media on brand development in Quebec. But in Ontario, I need some new distributors, so I'm going to put find distributor pages. I'm going to search out. I'm going to go into LinkedIn, maybe, or certainly onto Facebook and find new new distributors. I'm going to act more progressively when I go to a trade show, 
and search out distributors via the trade shows and interact and 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 even um, start to start to sort out any any applicants I have um, uh, online. And then overall, I could have uh, sort of applications and and um, facilities on my website for all of Canada. For example, selling online and e-commerce apps. So um, that's the sort of you know key sort of. Um, and again, I we, we will have a, a separate web a webinar at some point only on social media. But John, is there a quick time for a poll? There is, Susanna. I love that Star Wars. Right. There you go. I think that that's a very impressive use of. Uh, uh, the Star Wars analogy. So really, please, here we go. It's poll number four. I'm launching it now. Does your company use social media? There you go. Today's underpinning of many people's business, many companies um, are social media driven. Are you a yes once a month, approximately every quarter, irregularly? Are you thinking about it or is the answer no? How are you and your company about social media? Let me give you feedback. 40% are saying yes at least once a month, 38% yes but irregularly, 19% are thinking about it and a whole 6% are saying no. Well look, thank you, that's very, very useful, relevant information. These polls will be um, available, this information will be available to you as we said on Friday. I'm closing this one, here we go. That's the fourth and final poll and I hand back to Susanna. Thank you very much, John. Um, I want to just to put this slide up here without really uh, going into a lot of detail. Um, I think we've said it a couple of times during the webinar. A social media campaign is essential for any website uh, export or website uh, strategy. And the Canadians, uh, whether they're consumers or companies, are very reactive to social media. Um, they are they they look at it in fact even more than Americans they are more reactive whether it's to Facebook ads or uh, reviews online we have found uh, consistently that they uh, engage very directly and react very directly to social media so it is a, a worthwhile investment we will be having a webinar directly on on social media um, and, and highlighting Canada in particular. Um, so I'm going to leave that now um, because I want to leave a bit of time for questions. Just leave you with this little quote uh, from someone that I watch quite carefully, um, uh, the Senior Vice President of Worldwide Marketing at Apple, uh, who basically says and says again and again, a company's website is the most valuable sales and marketing tool you can have today. Uh, this is something that we have a, a very, very strong belief in uh, in terms of getting your 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 business online and exporting and growing your business and your brand and your sales internationally. So John, I've whizzed through my side, but I hope I've left a few minutes for questions. Yes, indeed. Thank you very much indeed. There are many questions. I've got the question box open now. I'm, I'm not going to, we are not going to be able to address them all. So please do know that we'll be coming back to you. Um, each one question will be answered. We'll get back in touch directly. Nancy, I'm going to jump to you first. This is a US company. They say they've just started. So there you go, kind of relevant to that. Just started exporting to Canada. They're saying, don't understand um, if there is NAFTA, why is crossing the border so complicated? And secondly, um, where is NAFTA going? Um, so uh, in this political climate, NAF, uh, uh, you know, Nazi, good luck. <laughs> yes, it certainly is an interesting time in terms of, uh, of, in terms of the NAFTA negotiations. But I guess to address the first question, why, you know, and many U.S. companies ask me this, if it's, if it is, if we are all part of NAFTA, why is it so challenging? And I think the thing to keep in mind, even with NAFTA in place, we are dealing with three different countries here, with three different regulatory regimes and three different customs regimes. So of course, when shipping product in Canada or shipping products and or services into the Canadian market, um, there are compliance issues, documentation issues that you need to be aware of and, and consider. And certainly, you know, once, once you, and it, first of all, working with good partners, whether it's customs brokers or working with um, state trade uh, offices and and their resources and, and as well as other government resources can be very helpful uh, but certainly once you get the hang of it once you um, 
understand that these that there are even software programs in place that can help to automate or automate um, the different customs documentation um, requirements. Once these are in place, uh, they can be very helpful in really managing the flow of um, of cross border activity between between Canada and the U.S. As well, I mean, with the NAFTA negotiations, certainly there's a lot of discussion in the press, not always positive, um, but on a, on a positive note, um, certainly the, the negotiations are ongoing. Um, we're now in the fourth round of negotiations. And, and you've got to realize there are a lot of tricky areas that, uh, that are under discussion. But I think we can take, um, you know, we can be hopeful in the sense that the folks that are negotiating these agreements are professional trade negotiators, um, business people, and ones that are really, you know, trying to keep um, trying to keep all three of the country's um, objectives in mind, and trying to really come up with the best compromise in terms of how we can grow NAFTA uh, and in, in improve it. I mean, you've got to realize this is actually kind of an outdated agreement in terms of the fact that, um, you know, there was no digital trade or digital economy when, when NAFTA came into force in 1994. So, um, so as I say, I think um, if we disregard the noise and, and look a little bit deeper at what, what is going on, it, it is mostly positive. So keep that, keep that in mind. Nancy, thank you. Great response. And, and quickly, I'm going to keep this to three more questions, Susanna. This one says, a UK company, they have some sales in Canada, their business model is all about distributors. Um, and they're saying, just wondering where to start with a Canadian website. Uh, over to you. Top chrono, how about 30 seconds? Uh, okay, the <laughs> simplest answer is give us a call, we'll build one for you. Um, but uh, I guess that's being uh, a bit commercial. Um, I would say the very first thing that we would do for them and that they should make sure that they do is that they own their domain name. And uh, the domain name in Canada is .ca. So in the UK, that's .co.uk. The equivalent in Canada is .ca. Um, now to um, uh, to own that, they have to go on a website called C-I-R-A, CIRA. Uh, and that will, um, there they can see all of these CA domains are managed by CIRA. And there you can register through a number of certified registrars. However, you have to have a Canadian presence requirement. So you have to fulfill this requirement. Broadly speaking, it means that you have to be an individual or a corporation within Canada. Um, the requirements are kind of strict, but there are some alternative ways of getting there and of getting is the .ca. Um, and, and certainly we've done that for, 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 for numerous companies um, uh, that work very well in terms of repointing it. Um, I would say as well, the important point here is don't hand over your top level domain, don't hand over your .ca, even if you've got a good distributor. Uh, this is your online real estate, it's your online brand. Don't hand it to someone outside your company like a good distributor. You never know if the good distributor will stay a good distributor, for example. So make sure you own that. That's the very first thing. That's step one. Well, step one is call us. Step two, own your, C own your .ca. How about that, John? <laughs> I like it. That works for me. Thank you very much, Nancy. Um, right, this, um, we're just starting to export to Canada. We're wondering if you have any tips. This is all about currency, currency fluctuations. What's your view, Nancy? Oh, Currency has always been a challenge between Canada and the United States and, and challenge, it's not really, a, it's not so much a challenge as a consideration. Um, you know, when you're selling your product into the Canadian market, if you're, if you're relying solely on price, that's not a good strategy to begin with. As I mentioned before, Canada being a mature market, it, it's really a, a market that requires a strong value proposition. And, and if you've got a very good quality product, great customer service, price is not always the first question. And in terms of managing currency fluctuations and, uh, and working with Canadian customers, I think US companies have to be cognizant that sometimes they may have to look at, um, at you know, can they offer discounts? Can they, can they do things in terms of managing delivery or, um, or shipping a larger amount of product into the Canadian market and, and working with a 3PL or distribution partner? so that they can ship in larger volumes and, and reduce cost. So I think there's a lot of different strategies for that, um, but it's, it's not, it, it, currency fluctuation is not 
is not something that should stop you from, from looking at Canada um, and looking at prospective customers there. Yes, thank you very much. Very sounds a very good common business sense. That makes a, a lot of sense there. Susanna, the last question then is, this is going to be, we export to Canada, do not do a lot of social media. Um, is there a good place to start? Um, well, there you go. Um, our last question, social media, Canada, uh, again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, I like the question because I think it's very important that the companies are already thinking that, you know, that you're already thinking about where to start on, on social media. You, it's, I, I can't emphasize enough how important it is to own your digital footprint and to take control of it um, and to be the one who's putting out the news about you and not have someone else put out the news about you. Um, I would also say do it, with, do it in, a, in a measured way. Don't start something that you can't finish. There's, um, you know, it's always very disturbing when you go on to a company and they, even looking at their last current events, you click on current events and there's something dating from like 2007, like, oh dear. That, similar with, with social media, you need to have a real cohesive strategy from the beginning. It can't just be the occasional sort of, you know, Facebook posting or something. It's got to be a strategy which is worked out but, and, and balanced, balanced between who is actually going to create the content who is posting it, where, and remember that social media is also localized and optimized. So, you know, putting it out there, making, doing it out work, if you're not putting it out the right way <laughs> and in the right, using the right words and the right terms, it has no effect. And that's a terrible waste of time and resources. So if you're going to do it, do it carefully, do it measured, have a full strategy on board before you start and make sure you can actually perpetuate it and, and drive it forward. You will find the results come in very quickly uh, if you do it correctly. Uh, we have a lot of case studies about, about that. It's just an amazingly efficient way of reaching out and engaging it with prospects. John, I think that's all I have time to say. <laughs> yes, oh, so thank you very much indeed. I'm sorry uh, we cannot answer any more questions. Um, we see them all. Um, we will get back to you one by one. Thank you for your continued submissions, um, even during question time, so we thank you there. Um, we thank you, everyone, for participating today. We do hope that you've had an enjoyable webinar, that you found a lot of useful information, lots of great takeaways to help you grow your business, or let's say for many, get started with your business and your exports to Canada. Um, there, don't forget there is a useful exporters guidebook, so if that can be of help to you as well, and you of course have all of the contact details of today's presenters. Um, do not forget that there is a questionnaire, so it's going to come through this little survey in a second when we shut down this uh, webinar. Um, the next webinar, the online global webinar series continues um, on October the 25th. It's called the Global Social Media Online Marketing for you to grow your exports. So please uh, don't hesitate to join us then. I want to thank Susanna, I want to thank Nancy for a great job done, um, really useful information and from all of us to, to all of you, uh, we wish you great success. Let's all go now and sell online in Canada and grow our exports, grow our sales, grow our brands and business. And this, this applause, there you go, that's for Susanna, that's for Nancy. Thank you both very much and we wish you every success going forward. Thank you from IBT Online. We wish you a great day. Bye-bye.